All right, it's Jeff Mayhew, it's John Beatty, it's Politics and Parenting, where we talk about politics, but we talk about it differently. John, were you in Paris last week? Yes, I, I did sneak away for a couple of days. Uh, you gotta love a friend who, you know, and this tells you how good a friend is, who um, tells your mother that you and your that you and your wife need to go on a trip after the campaign. And so this is kind of, this has been in the works for a, for a, a probably half a year, almost a year at this point, I guess. Um, So I had a friend who helped with the campaign and told my mom that my wife and I needed to get away. And uh, it all ended up that we went to Paris. So um, it was, uh, it's amazing. It's, I wasn't, wasn't really sure what I was getting into, but um, the fact that many people who go there seem to fall in love with the city and can't stop thinking about it. I'm definitely guilty of that at at the moment. So uh, I'm you know, I, I was just pitching you, we should do some kind of Madison Republicans uh, conference <laughs> in Paris. But I mean, it's, I mean, it's it's an amazing city. Like there's just so much history behind it. Like, you know, you think our country um, is, uh, we're coming up to our 250th anniversary of the constitution in uh, what, 10, 15 years. Um, and then we, you know, people have been on the continent for a hundred years, 150 years, at least the Europeans. And you know, there's the Native Americans have been here for a lot longer than that. But, you know, we're a relatively a, a young on this side. And you go to the, some of these churches that have been there for 1400, you know, they've been in that spot for 1400 years plus. And uh, you just can only marvel at the scale. And, then, you know, of course, that's nothing compared to like the Egyptian pyramids. But, um, you know, I, I had some time on the uh, plane ride to do some reading. So I finished the myth of left and right, which we had talked about earlier that um, book by Verlin Hugh Lewis and Hiram Lewis, just kind of about this myth of, of left and right. Um, and one of the cool things about the left and the right is that that actually comes from France and the French Revolution. And the idea that, you know, if you sat on one side of the house um, or whatever, I forget what they call it, but if you sat on one side of the room, you were considered to be part of this tribe. And if you sat on the other side of the room, you were considered to be part of this other tribe. And um that idea of left and right was actually co-opted by the communists. And so they use that to describe themselves. So if you heard the Nazis being described as right wing, that's just because they're to the right of the communist spectrum, if you will. And the socialists, the Bolsheviks in Russia were considered the more pure on the left. So, you know, there's just this, this idea of dividing people and trying to break us into easily discernible buckets. And I like that's something that um, is really interesting in this book where they just break down ideas. And so you know, one of the, one of my favorite is um, the idea of Barry Goldwater, who's considered, you know, the father of conservatism, the conservative movement. Um, and then contrasting that with, with Ronald Reagan, who was one of the, uh, one of the most conservative presidents. But if you look at four different policy positions in terms of uh, taxes, government intervention, abortion, and um, affirmative action and civil rights, they're actually completely opposite on all four of those. So, you know, like, that kind of it breaks it apart you you um you see uh the fact that we tell us ourselves these stories in order to uh, find some kind of tribe some kind of group that we belong to but in reality the parties uh since day one of our republic have kind of formed around ideas and then they just sort of cycle party planks in and out depending on on what they think is going to get them elected you know well Um, yeah um so I got to, I got a chance. John wrote an article about this, right? Um, it's very very good. Uh, it will come out later this week. And so I love in like the opening paragraph where you kind of you hammer on hammer in this idea that came from like my perceptive of like reading Madison, which is we have this past. It's really important. We don't have to like ridicule what they failed at. We just need to mm-hmm. learn from what they failed at. And you, you use a, a exactly. good, good analogy with, with the the elements table, right? It's like, we can make fun of for what they didn't know, but like, you know, or we could use what they know plus what we know and move forward. And that's what Madison really did. And then you, you, you come back to him because you talk about how he like, he was the federalist for the central government. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. it was, he was the opposite. He was a Democratic Republican. And again, it 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 lets you see, like, when you read history, what are you looking for? Are you studying, like, political theory, which is, like, the understanding of balancing and having a, a safe structure for society? Or are you studying, like, political partisanship? 
you know? And like, I think the way to figure out is who, what do they believe is like, how do they act? <laughs> do they stay mm -hmm. true to their, their core beliefs? And Madison's was this balance system. And when he went, felt one side was going off, he jumped to the other side. Um, but it's that party system started there and it started with him. Right. No, because it, it was, you know, there was the division about the Constitution in terms of people. Um, well, you know, going back to you, had this idea for a balanced government. He was helped shepherd the Constitutional Convention uh, key and in, in a lot of the, bring a lot of the ideas forward with the Virginia plan. Um, but then once it was, it was uh, deter, you know, decided upon, the convention was, was done and they sent it to all the states. He then took up his pen along with Hamilton and John Jay in order to write those Federalist Papers in order to kind of help sell this new idea and get people uh, on board with it. So, um, you know, he, in one sense, he's a Federalist because he supports the federal structure. Uh, but then once he gets, once the, the Constitution passes and he kind of sees how Hamilton, I think in particular, um, was using general it, if you look at the, the general welfare, yeah, you know, the trying to ram a, a bus through that little, um, that line right there. But uh, um, just the way that like the world changes you know you you write the constitution thinking that that um you're just going to kind of stick to yourself and you'll go back to the, the trade the way it was and normal relationships with other countries but then europe comes by and says no we actually don't want to trade with you in, on those previous terms and we're gonna uh hold you hold your feet to the fire make life difficult for you and that just causes uh, challenges that you didn't anticipate and so you kind of have to reevaluate, look at it. I'm thinking like going back to France, like the French Revolution, um, that changed politics in America. Like you've got the XYZ affair where, uh, what is it? They're, they're trying to bribe American minister. The French are trying to bribe American ministers in order to, for us to get trade access. Is that what it was? I recall. Was I mean, like that's well, totally different than- I think I have, I have to pull it out. <laughs> but, the, but the key thing is like, there's foreign influence in America's domestic policy that, that probably wasn't anticipated. And, you know, we and thought, well, we'll just be our own. Today? Like today, yeah. So, no, Citizen Janae, remember? Oh, so, yeah. Was, so you had Citizen Janae and the XYZ affair in like a very little bit amount of time. Yeah, and so, you know, like that leads to the Alien and Sedition Act because people in Congress are like, whoa, 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 we can't have this, this uh, foreign influence. And that just... That's a huge uh, usurpation of national power. And you can see where Madison would push back and say that ah, really, maybe that wasn't exactly what I had anticipated. So like, you know, you, um, I guess the preamble that I think about is um, if you think about elements, like we've got 118 elements in a periodic table and theoretically you could have more. And I think they're, you know, if you can get the right mass of um, neutrons and protons and stuff, but you know, in the, in the ancient times they had like four elements, right? Earth, wind, fire and water and it was very basic and and i think our two-party system the um that mechanic is not the basic but the idea that we fall into two different ideologies and it's only those two ideologies and there's only a gradation between those that you have to slide upon like that's that's what the authors of the myth and left and right are trying to point out that that's so false and just like the way they go through and they feel like here's an example here's an example here's an example and so i i think that's so much more like the element period out of table where you've got 118 elements you know, we don't have two positions in any election as much as we like to think so. Like maybe there's 118 different positions that someone could take some kind of collection of those. And so parties tend to just sort of grab particular positions that they think they can kind of jive with what they've already got going, or maybe they eject things. Um, yeah. They don't like it at all. And in an effort to win elections. And I think our politics now is so much on, um, there's a couple core things that you got to believe in. If you don't, we don't want to even talk to you. I mean, like Carrie Lake was going on and said, if you are a John McCain Republican, don't vote for me. And I'm sure those people didn't vote for her and she'd lost the Arizona governor's race. Like that's so backwards in terms of what a party is, is supposed to do in terms of getting people elected. And it shouldn't be an ideology and a purity test. And then, yeah. you know, when we talk about the, the issues that candidates bring forward, it shouldn't just be, are you conservative or liberal? You should really dive into that. And that's what you've been so much in favor of, like, where do people actually stand on particular issues, you know? And, and you know, you could talk about education or something, like, where does a parent's role fit in that? Where do teachers fit in that? It's much more complicated than saying, like, oh, parents all the way, no matter what. I mean, like, you got to, you, you're, de you as a parent are delegating a lot to the teacher. So, like, what are you giving to the teacher in return for that? Yeah, I mean, 
if you want to like boil it down to like you pick a side, right? Like the question I've been asking people is, do you want to govern yourself or do you want to be ruled? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's not really like partisanship. That's like a decision on the structure of government that you have. Um, we are a self-governing republic, plain and simple. That's what we are. Um, how we do it is through representation and having adequate representation is incredibly important. I mean, um, I put out two articles over the last two weeks, one on Franklin Pierce, one on President Tyler. President Tyler has this idea of extending the Madisonian sphere. And the Madisonian sphere is, you know, he he manipulates it because the sphere is adequate representation for equal parts of the society, right? You have the, the high level, you got the Senate, and then you've got like the people, the house. And the you know, three-fifths compromise was a manipulation of that. And then pushing that, extending that sphere continues the imbalance, right? For 13 colonies, the imbalance of power um, between the North and the South because of, of the compromise wasn't that much. But as you start to add states to the union and you use that as your focus, now it throws it off more. And then it becomes mm -hmm. a question of like the South starts using their imbalance of power to make decisions for the North. So now like the North isn't like governing themselves anymore. They're being ruled, you know, and that's, that's what happens when you have that imbalance of power. And I think realistically our capped house has created an imbalance of power in our nation. And we as American citizens aren't really governing ourselves as much as we're being ruled. And that's because it's too expensive to run for a local office. It's too hard to get a hold of your representative. Um, they, you know, they, the parties, you know, you get, if you try to vote or you try to be part of their, uh, you know, club by going to events, they bombard you with text messages and emails that make you not want to be a part of this thing because you got to like a regular life and then they hound you for money, right? And that what the, mm -hmm. what does that do? It pushes, pushes regular citizens to be like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a part of this. Thing. Just solve my problems for me. Go ahead, rule me. I don't want to be part of the system that you created that's really like cumbersome. And, uh, you know, I think like, I understand like where Lewis is coming, like the myth of left and right. It's not left and right. It's like rulers and and uh, ruled. And you have to decide mm -hmm. which one you want to be. And as American citizens, we should all pick to be a ruler of our own life. Yeah, and, and that doesn't follow along partisan lines. Like, I think you could, like going back to the delegating everything to the team, like it's so common that you just say, well, I just, this is my team. You know, you hand, you guys handle it. Um, hopefully it'll work out. But I, I think going try the the real thing is we got to pull back and fix that representation problem where the people that we have delegated to to manage the, the power and the authority, that they actually do listen to us and they actually consider us rather than whatever their donors say. And, and um, you know, I think it all goes back to it goes back to Paris, France, and I'm now hopelessly in love with but like, the revolution there as you as you walk through like the Louvre Museum and you just see the ostentation and the power and the prestige that sits in that like one palace. Um, we didn't get a chance to go to Versailles and hear that's even more uh, beautiful and ornate. But like you can see where these people were just so out of touch with the common man. And mm -hmm. when you've got a new change in terms of communication, new ideas that come in, if you've got your uh, monarchy and then you've got people underneath you that don't feel represented. And then they hear of this amazing experiment on the other side of the ocean that's actually been kind of successful where they are able to throw off the bondage. You might be thinking to yourselves as the people like, well, we should throw off our own bondage. And then you just, um, because it doesn't have the same, you know, you, you may think it's the same, but it's definitely not the same. And I'd like to, I'm going to think more about this, like comparing the revolutions between the United States and, and France and where they're the same or they're different, but you know, it's very much different in France because the people weren't self-governed. Like in the United States, we had 13 self-governing colonies that really just wanted representation in parliament. Yeah. But in France, you've got a monarchy and you've got, you kind of have a fourth, the, 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 there's like the, the equivalent of the Lords and the equivalent of lower house. And you've got this, um, I think it's called it like the tennis court parliament or something. I'd, um, I'm trying to like dig back in my European history from high school, but like, you know, there was kind of air quotes representation, but it really wasn't that. And so when you just throw everything off, that's where it gets bloody. And I think it, devolves into something that perhaps people didn't think it was going to go so you know uh so rep representative beware you know you got to listen to your people otherwise uh 
well, they'll, come, they'll come protest. I think the big difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is exactly what you just hit on, the 13 different colonies that were already governing themselves, okay? What they had different than the French is the right people. They had the right leaders because in order to have a like really good self-governing society, you have to have a balance of representation, but also a balance of, of structural leaders across the nation to pull everything together. Without that, what you'll end up with is uh, just a rich aristocracy fighting a monarch, which, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, and and that rich aristocracy is almost as out of touch with the people as the monarch. And so what you get right. is bloodshed, <laughs> you know, where in in our revolution, people like John Adams were like regular people. OK, they they like were suffering just like everybody else. And so they are they're just they're much closer to the problem. You know, they're closer to what's going on. And I think that makes a big difference in your ability to govern. And, you know, I think that's part of the issue we have today. Right. It's just. We have the wrong people leading us. We have people that want to be in power, but in reality, like, you know, who should be in power, like our professors, like the, the people like running the, not the running the colleges, but there are like political mm -hmm. theory professors all across history professors. Like these are the people realistically that are probably most prepared to govern and understand, you know, this type of stuff. But we are putting, you know, I mean, you see celebrities running for Congress, you see um, them winning the White House, you know, but like, that's because Did they have the money. There's a, there's this guy in California who's running for Schiff's uh, old seat. Um, Boy Meets World, name. man. Yeah, the Boy Meets World, well, yeah. Ben Sa it's Ben Savage, right? I don't, I don't know. I just, I I just saw the headline and his, his brother I was, was, I was so shocked that I, I cut his name out of my mind, I guess. Oh my God. I loved Boy Meets World growing up. Like that was one of my favorite shows. Um, I, I saw that he was running. I haven't looked up his platform, but please, please uncap the house. <laughs> like call me, I will give you all the, all the help you need. I don't even know what side of the aisle you're running on yet. I don't care. Just uncap the house, Ben. Come on, Boy Meets World. Let's go. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, well, I was in France. You, you were also uh, tra traversing our great country. Uh, going to our nation's capital. I was. I went to the principal's first conference. How was that? It was good. <laughs> it was good yeah. You know, like when somebody like asks you, like, you know, you you, you get back from um, like a first date, right? And it, and it was, you know, like there was no real big negatives, but you know, it was just all right. It was I. Right. You know, I guess you get worked up in your head that something's going to be more than it is. And then you get there and you get a little let down. Maybe that's, maybe that's my high expectations for everything. I don't know. <laughs> there is a, there is a virtue to having low expectations going in, you know? <sighs> yeah, I know. But so, so what was, what was, what, let's say what's, what was one positive from the, uh, from the conference? Okay. So my favorite thing from the conference was Sarah Isker. Okay. So she's, she does the dispatch um, advisory opinions podcast so I've heard her there a lot, and I do enjoy her, David French. Um, it's like a law podcast. Um, she, <clears throat> so she did an interview with uh, Tevi. What's his last name? I, I think we actually Tevi met Troy. Him. Yeah, Tevi Troy. Yeah, yeah. We, okay. I think we met him at the um, at one of the conferences we went to. But anyways, he's a delight, right? Because like he mm -hmm. he he knows as much as about or probably more about presidents than I do. Um, he's yeah. writing books about him, where I'm just still reading them. Um, and he had some great insights. Um, Sarah did a great job interviewing. I liked a couple points that she made, or they made. Um, like we don't teach Lincoln correctly in school, you know, like the assassination. Like most of us grew up thinking that it was Lincoln that was assassinated, but he was like a full coup, right? Like they were trying to take mm -hmm. down. The oh, war. right. And um, who was it? Is it? She told the story. It was Seward, who was like mm -hmm. one of his. He got when he woke up. Um, and he saw Lincoln wasn't there. He knew he was dead because he said, if if he was alive, he would already be here. And that's right. Yeah, no, that's such a powerful thing in the, in the, when you read the biography. I know, man. And they they brought that up and I'm just like, like this, this is my type of conference right here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, a really cool part, I can't, I think it was during the Tevi interview. Um, one of the questions was about the concentration of executive power. And 
you know, they're <laughs> talking about it. And Sarah, you know, she goes, I want to just point out, it's not just a concentration of executive power, but essentially an abdication of power by Congress. And like, yes. I could not agree more. Right. I mean, that that was and there was an applause from the room with that. <laughs> She's like, you guys are nerds. And I'm like, yes, we are. But that's a good thing, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so I love that interview she did. Um, uh, let's see. There was I can't remember, uh, James Walner. He's with R Street Institute. He spoke. He was like one of the first like the first segment after Heath opened up the place. And uh, he was fantastic as well. Uh, I got a chance to talk with him in the hallway. And we talked about uh, uh, Calhoun's congruent, congru yeah, congruent majorities. We talked about Madison Sphere. Um, I showed him uh, our Republic uh, thing. He At first, he was like, oh, he saw the pyramid. And he's like, starts to draw something down. He's like, well, think of it more like this. And I flipped the page. I showed him where it's like representation is communication. It's a cone. And he looked at it. And he's like, oh, no, this is great. <laughs> Excellent. Good, good, good. I was like, all right, cool. I'm doing something okay. Like he didn't say it was garbage. <laughs> but I had a really good conversation. He had a really like uplifting, positive message. You know, he quoted Madison from the Federalist Papers. He's, you know, got the right idea as far as, you know, the way we should think about government and ruling ourselves versus being ruled. Um, the, let's see, I, I, I told him in the hallway, I was like, you should run for office. Like you should be, you should be in our Congress. Like we need people like him. And this goes back to like what you were talking about. What's the difference between the French revolution and the American revolution, the people, right? The smartest mm -hmm. people who understood the government, like government best, not politics, but government and those two things are different. Like, I don't care. Like politics is like a manipulation of people. It's like advertising. Right. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's all well and good. You can advertise and that will make you money. But what keeps us safe is people who understand government. <laughs> okay. And like, you know, he was like, I'm not going to run for office. Like, I think he's like a professor at, at South Carolina or Clemson, Clemson or something like that. Like, why would he want to run for office other than that? Yeah. We need we need people like that. <laughs> oh, that it's good for for everyone. I'm, well, I'm I'm listening to um, one of these books on the American history, and it's after the Constitution, and the, this whole chapter right now is about sort of the right people for it. And you know, like you you've got some of the um, early founders; they were lawyers and stuff, but they really wanted to be wanted to harken back to that sort of Roman leisure class almost, where they had the time and energy to devote all their time to thinking about government problems rather than like running a business or um, like it talks about Ben Franklin. He, uh, he stood for 13 elections, but Ben Franklin swears, like he never really ran for the elections. He just sort of was asked by the people. I mean, like that, that's, there is a lot of that, that is a, an admirable quality in, in terms of something. Now in our day and age, you kind of have to um, do the politicking in order to get in there and hopefully to change, be an example and change the system. But, you know, like that is kind of the, the beginnings um, that I think uh, would be good to move a little bit back back towards. Yeah, and and like I mean that's that's the pushback I get from people is like, well, you can't change it. You it, this is the way that it is, and I go like I get it, and I I recognize we're not going all the way back to the way that it was, but like we can pare it back a little bit. We can write mm -hmm. some campaign finance laws. Like there are things we can do to help ourselves like realistically we the people can solve these problems <laughs> it's we're not, not little it's, helpless kids it's not really as complicated as the parties make it sound realistically mm -hmm. um but okay so principles first why do i go to principles first right like that's like where does the expectation goes i go to principles first because like what you were talking about with the, the myth of the left and right. I'm tired of parties who manage from top down. They don't listen. Mm -hmm. They just want our data so they can bombard us with advertisements and ask us for money. And when we show up to help, they just want to put us to work, knock doors, do this. But they don't want to listen to us. Right. Right. And now you've gotten these two party systems, they've gotten so far out of like actually solving problems. All they focus on is telling us why the other guy is wrong. And right. 
I go to, I go to principles first because I'm looking for something different, plain and simple. I'm looking for something different. We're trying to build something different where we're at. So I'm going to this other organization that's bigger and I'm looking for help, right? It's like, here I am, here is what I've done. Like, how can we partner? Um, I want to be able to talk <laughs> like, and so, and I want to be able to talk about real things. And so I mentioned a couple of the, uh, the stuff that I really liked about the conference, um, just like political thought, political theory, um, real discussions about history. These are really important in, in governing ourselves, but I can't help but walk away feeling like it's just another party because of all the other things they talked about. I mean, there's a lot of talk about January 6th and Trump, right? And like, I mm -hmm. get it, no fan. But like, we have to, we have to face the problems in the future. We cannot keep fighting those in the past. Like, it doesn't mean to let this person off the hook. It just means to stop talking about it when we're trying to make progress. At an event like this, you're going to turn people away, right? Um, in the other interview that Sarah Isner did, um, she had Judge Michael Ludick. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And he's a uh, U.S. Court of Appeals on Fourth Circuit. And all he wanted to do is talk about Trump and treason and all this type of stuff. And to the point where he said, <laughs> he said this comment, he goes, talking about whether what Trump did was considered treason or not, he said it was treason. And then he said, well, it was treason-like. And as somebody who's not a lawyer, but have has read a lot about lawyers and read common law and trying to make his way through Blackstone's commentaries. I wonder what that means coming from a judge. Like it isn't the court's responsibility to un interpret the law, which means interpret the word treason for what it is and then make a decision about it. How can you say something is treason like, you know, it yeah. either is or it isn't. And, you know, coming from like somebody like me or somebody like you, okay, yeah, you can say that. But if you were a judge, a U.S. Court right. of People's judge, standing in front of a whole bunch of people who are there because they're looking to be led somewhere better than where we are, how can you muddy the waters so much, you know? Um, because you're a leader. You're on the stage. We are listening to you. Um, that was, I don't know, disappointing. You know, you look – you. Like I said, high expectations, high hopes. Um, people that have power, you know, the microphone is the power. If you got the microphone in your hand, be careful with what you say. Um, some people may not make think it's that big of a deal, but it is because once you, if you really believe that what he did is commit treason, then explain to us how it was treason. You know, say that it was treason, and this is why it was treason. Don't walk around saying it was treason-like. Nobody's going to take that home and believe that um yeah maybe you just realized like he actually shouldn't be in the in the prognostication or the the sort of condemnation game before a, a case actually may come before him so maybe that's like he's out you know if if it will so and if that's the defense the lawyer comes in and says like oh you said it was treason you gotta uh you have to um what is it uh not sit out but uh there's like some term for it but basically you can't rule this case you so maybe he's like well i didn't say it was treason so it's treason like you know so I mean, uh, maybe that's, but, but that's, but that's just as bad. Like then he brought it up, right? Like yeah. he wanted mm -hmm. to talk about it. Like, it was, and he was very upfront about that in the interview. He told Sarah, "Is like, Sarah got all these questions for me. And I said, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Right. And then he proceeded to talk about what he wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to talk about that. And I was there to listen to a lawyer and a judge talk about real stuff that is like facing and hurting my family. Right. And right. And I didn't get that. I got. I did get to ask a question. My question was, because um, he was talking about the partisanship and how bad it is in the courts today. And he also was talking, they, they were also talking about the conservative movement that kind of led to Dobbs. And so my question was twofold. I said, how do you compare the fighting between the people or the federal government and the courts compared to where we were at the beginning because you know you had Madison versus Marbury that's a that's a 
that's a battle. That's a power battle. Realistically, you had uh, Madison and Jefferson and John Randolph trying to impeach Samuel Chase. You had, you know, fight after fight after fight where they're at war with each other. How is it any different then than it is now? You know, and that leads all the way up to Tawny being put on the bench, right, for Jackson's purposes. Um, and he basically, you know, uh, so uh, let me, before he answered that one, let me finish my question there, was I said, and you're talking about the conservative Dobbs. I said, who writes the law, the legislatures or the courts? And as conservatives, should we be focusing our movement through the courts to change the law? Or should we be focusing it through the legislatures as it is intended to do? And that way, it's not a short-term win, but a permanent long-term win. Um, a good question. I, thought that was, I thought that was a layup, man. The answer is so obviously the legislatures write the law, not the courts. And if you want a true positive conservative movement to get rid of, to like make sure that abortion is, you know, not federal law, then you write it through the legislature. Um, I don't think I got my question answered. <laughs> Let's just say that. that. Yeah. He, he no, just, he, that. He, he, he was like, he basically said, no, it's way worse now. And then he didn't explain why. And then uh, he said something else that I don't even think really fit the rest of my question. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, is he, let me ask you, is he writing a book or trying to sell a book? Because, I mean, you know, you need some kind of uh, <clears throat> problem that you got to write about that you've got the solution to. And then, um, then oh, you so can sell your book on that. He's keeping it. Well, you know, that's funny because Bolton was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I believe I so I didn't actually see uh, the interview with Bolton. Like I said, I was there for different reasons. I wasn't there to, like, watch every person they come out to talk about Trump. Like, I don't want to talk about Trump which is why I wasn't in half the room or half the time mm -hmm. I was sitting outside of the room reading and writing as opposed to listening about Trump. Um, but I hear the interview. That's also with, why you didn't go to CPAC, right? <laughs> that's also why I didn't. Well, so here's the thing that brings me, let's, let's skip the part about Bolton and Trump. I don't really care that much about that. Let's talk about the CPAC thing because, so let me find this real quick. Like, my thing is, stop telling me the other guy's bad. Stop telling me the other guy's a loser. Just tell me why you're without good. without. Well, you know, but you could say like this person's bad and for X, Y, and Z reason. Like I'll give you that. But when you just say they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, and that's because and you know they're bad because we're good. Like that doesn't that doesn't convince anyone. And again, that goes back to like the parties being smaller and smaller and more insular because you're not actually reaching out to people. It just becomes a matter of. How bad can you smear the other side where someone feels so so disgusted by the other side that they have to they feel compelled to vote for you because they got no other choice? Like that's I think that's the backwards part. But so this is for this is from the opening. It says they tell us that we're all victims of our institutions, that they are rigged against us, and that some other group of Americans, the rich, the woke, or the elite, are to blame. They tell us if we just elect them. They will save us and punish those other Americans who don't think like us or talk like us or look like, look like us. This, as far as I can tell, is their only principle. Protect the, who they agree with and punish those who they don't. That is not a re recipe for American greatness. And then at the end, he talks about CPAC. And he talks about how CPAC is not doing so good. And America's, our principles first, is doing good. And I can't help but think, isn't that dividing us? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe there's people in the room that like, like some of the people that were in the room of CPAC. Maybe yes. they have something in common with them. Do you need to... Do you need to put something in between you and the people that showed all the way up to Washington, D.C.? Yes, a lot of people that showed up at Washington, D.C. this weekend, they were there and they were totally fine with the constant talk about January 6th and Trump and whatnot. But if what's your what's your objective here? 
Is your objective to bring people together or is it to divide them? I'm not a Trump fan and I felt divided, right? Like I, I'm just, I'm so over that. I just wanna, I just wanna work on the problem, you know? And like, if we're talking about that other person and we're talking about how CPAC's failing, then we're not working on the problem. We're not talking about something that matters. And like, that was my biggest like disappointment. It's like, I was looking for something serious, right? I mean, my thing is, is like, what do I talk about all the time, John? Like, what do we want for the Madisonian Republicans? I want people that understand history, work hard, and aren't afraid to tell me when I'm wrong, plain and simple. I want people who dissent. And all I can tell is the, the Republican Party, from my point of view, from a local level, doesn't want people that dissent. From my experience with the Ford Party, they don't want people who dissent. My experience with Principles First is they don't want people who dissent. I had a chance to speak with a whole bunch of the people who were on like their leadership team. And I know that they spoke with Craig. Craig went with me. You know Craig, right? I know Craig. I've met him once or twice. Yeah. Craig's a smart guy, really smart guy. He has a depth of knowledge of history. And he's not afraid to tell you when he disagrees with you. And he's not afraid to tell you why he disagrees with you. And he will sit there and he will listen to any argument you have back and have a cordial conversation with you. They didn't find Craig, right? If your organization is going to grow, like somebody should, somebody in that organization should have talked to Craig, found Craig and moved him up the ladder and be like, hey, Craig, you're in Virginia. We don't have anything going on in Virginia. We need you to be a leader. Like you were the type of person that we need on our team. Nobody did that which means how are they gonna grow? What are they looking for? What's their purpose? Um, it concerns me. You know, as somebody that wants to see them succeed, it concerns me. Yeah, I mean, the growth plan is, is key to any organization. Um, outreach, getting people interested, letting people know what you're doing, but I think giving people that opportunity to uh, have some kind of say it and, and where things go. I think, you know, as you're pointing out, like that's what's missing. And it's very much, well, we don't like the Republicans. We don't like the Democrats. So we're going to have our own thing. And it is division, div divisive. It's like, well, you, you to be part of this, you can't like the Republicans and you can't like the Democrats. So um, that's how you, that's kind of what's going to set us apart, which is, is no better than where we were before. It's just more of the same uh, dissenting. And I think if I was going to go back to the positive spin, like, I think that's why we're trying to be different because we're not really, we're trying to sort of be able to be in both parties. I mean, like, if you wanted to, I think looking at the sort of the issue, the planks of uh, representation, like every party should care about representation. Everyone should care about representation. So that's not necessarily a Democrat or Republican issue. And it's not something that we want to divide people away because we don't agree on other issues. Like, I think that's, we kind of want to, we've got this idea, like, these are the key things that need to get fixed. And then we can have better debates about the other issues. We can break things into smaller bits, uh, fight, quibble, uh, have constructive arguments about the smaller sections of the of everyday issues. And then we can come up with solutions to those problems or compromises or something. You know, when everything is so big, um, going back to our own kind of internal revolution, like the Civil War, like the big issue was slavery and that was what divided everyone. And <clears throat> we couldn't really find common ground on that. And it was, that was what, divided us apart and you know that's different than when the country was founded uh the 60 70 years before that because everyone around that time thought slavery would eventually phase out but um i think if you kind of get complacent and you don't try to find the common ground don't try to like keep everyone moving together and try to keep bringing people together that's where you you get this polarization and this fight and then you can't end up solving these problems because no one wants to work with each other no one wants to talk with each other yeah. Yeah. Um, so just a, a couple more things on, um, they talked about CPAC a lot, which, you know, like, come on, whatever. Who cares? Um, there was, so they had, uh, they had a couple people there, like that were outside of the principles first that, um, uh, they, I guess, I don't know if it's a sponsor or like what you would call it. So rank choice voting had a spot outside. You know how I feel about rank choice voting, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, but I don't have it like, 
having those things are good. Like that's not a negative to me of principles first. I think it's good. Those are the ideas, right? That we, that we have. Um, and so we actually, I would, I would encourage more of that, right? Like there was one booth, like there could have been 15, right? The Madisonian Republicans could have had a booth there, right? Um, that would have been great to have that offer, that opportunity. Um, cause we're doing something different than everybody else. We're teaching government, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. um, and then, so they also had no labels. Are you familiar with no labels? Uh, most of my, sh my shirts do have labels, so. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, not really. No labels is, I guess, a, a, you know, it's the first time I've really heard about it. Um, it's a political organization. It sounds like they work with members of Congress to group like the House and Senate together. It's just basically a party, right? It, that's what it is. Let's mm -hmm. face it. It's just a third party. Um, and they go like, let's have a no labels candidate or something. And like, or let's have a no labels legislation where like Democrats and Republicans come together and compromise. But it's like through coercing the Senate and the House to work together, which you know how I feel about that. They're not supposed to work together. They're adversaries. One's the state's response, the state, one's the people. They represent different things. They shouldn't work in unison outside of it. That's what the party does that breaks the system down. So I don't well, really- Well, no, they, they do work together because you got to pass something between both houses. And cool. so- Yes, but as far as like writing the legislation together, right? Because why are you writing it together? You know, what you're really doing is you're- Oh, I see, yeah, I see what you mean. Trying to to bypass the, the normal workings where yes. you have an idea, the Senate comes up with one version, the House comes up with another version, and then you try to make it work in committee and then they both go back and they vote on it. So I, right. I see what you mean, trying to circumvent that. Yes. Um, and and maybe I'm wrong on that. Like, but this is what I took away from the the 10 minute thing that she gave me. So, you know, like I tell everybody, there's what you say and what people hear. They're not always the mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. And they're not always the listener's fault. Sometimes they're the speaker's fault. I do it all the time. I say things and my wife is like, what? And I'm like, that's not what I meant. Let me correct myself. <laughs> um so um let's see. He talked about rejecting populism to a degree and like i understand where he's coming from and this is heath right this was in his opening remarks um i understand where he's coming from with that if you read history populism can be dangerous mm -hmm. but if you understand like where we're at in the moment that we're having you just have to get the fact that we have massive wealth disparity we have a massive power imbalance populism is the answer to the problem right? It's it's not to have another ruling elite rule us. It's to engage and educate the population and have them have a say in their government. You know, expanding mm -hmm. the house is population or populism, realistically, because you're giving people power. Um, you're giving more people power. You know, the American Revolution, in a large degree, was a populist movement. You know, you can't, you can't look around that. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea to just reject populism because you're going to reject and not to say that he specifically said i reject populism right like but this is again right. the takeaway from his speech that i you know i i hear and i've read it too <laughs> so you're if you're doing that you're you're cutting off your foot again mm -hmm. do do i want to see principles first be successful yes then don't cut off your foot okay because you gotta you got a marathon to run you got years of work ahead of you. Um, what I will give, uh, and I've never really met Heath. I would have liked to. Uh, I was going to try to speak with him at the end of the day on Sunday, but like schedules, whatever, kids got to get home. Um, so I wasn't able to do that. I wish that one of the people that I met that was on his leadership team would have brought me to Heath. Because again, I think that's that's a good leadership structure. That's a test, realistically, because right. that's what I would do. If I was running that organization, I would tell my leadership team, if you meet people like Craig or you meet people like Jeff and you have to describe what type of people we are, bring them to me. I want to talk to them. Or just like if you think someone's interesting, like even if it doesn't fit whatever the preconceived notions are, you say like this person is unique and could be, uh, could be a strength to the organization. Absolutely. You know who I wouldn't talk to every time is I wouldn't talk to the person who was standing alone in the hallway. And they are almost always the most interesting person in the room. Um, they've got great stories. Uh, I talked to this guy who was like uh, 35 years in the Air Force. He's just, he just wants to make a difference. He just wants to do something. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and he's like looking for an objective, right? He's, you know, cause I asked him, I said, why are you here? And he's like, I just, I see these problems. I've seen them all over the world. And I just, I can't believe I'm seeing them at home. And I, I want to do something. And I said, what are you looking to get out of this? And he says, um, an objective, essentially. He's like, I was in the Air Force structure is good for me. Um, I just need a goal. And I'm like, did they give you one? <laughs> the principles first did you walk <laughs> away with a goal. Did you walk away with structure? Um, but no. Or no. with a credit card donation form where he could send his money, right? No. And that is credit to Heath and his organization because they oh, did okay. Okay. not beat you over the head for money, not one time. And that is absolutely like wonderful because when i talk about like the party structure and the things that drives people away from it that is part of it and the fact that heath understands that and heath is doing the right thing there he deserves like you know a whole big round of applause because you know it's easy for me to sit here on this podcast and just dismantle his meeting and say this was wrong this mm -hmm. was wrong this was wrong well look at all the things that was right Look at all the people he got in the room. Look at all the connections that he made. Look at the organization that he's built. These are great, you know, achievements that he's been able to do. Um, they're stepping stones. It's year three. Like in year five, he may be where that is. Um, I just want him to grow faster. I just think that we could, you know, little, just very little changes um, can make a big difference in his organization. And like, just like our government, it's all about communication. What does Principles First stand for? Tell us that and nothing more. Stop telling us what the other guy is doing. Just talk about yourself and your goals, okay? That's what people That's what people really want to hear. And then the next thing is make sure that you have a, a leadership structure that reaches from the guy standing alone in the hallway all the way to you and that you find somebody, find some way to make sure that that person is always engaged. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I think if principles first does that, they have like huge success, just massive success. And I, I wish, I wish that it happens <laughs> one day. So, um, I guess, uh, what is March is also Moby Dick month and, uh, Madison Republicans. So that's, if you guys want to stay engaged, you can read Moby Dick along with us. That was one of the things I got to do in the plane is I'm like a, a six of the way through. Did you start? I haven't started. Oh, I oh yeah. Oh man. I, so it's, I, it's, it's so great that you guys are all reading it. So I, just so everybody knows I'm reading my Calhoun book and well, no, it was, it was the indivisible book, but anyways, Moby Dick comes up. It comes up in my Calhoun book. And I was like, guys, I'm reading Moby Dick. Cause apparently it's a critique on Jacksonian politics. And I thought it was about a whale. So I'm like, we got to read this or I got to read this. And then all of a sudden Craig's going to read it. John's going to read it. It's fantastic. I love it. No. Um, so I, I think I, as I, we talked in our chat, like I air quotes read it in high school. I don't really remember a whole lot of it. Um, but coming into it with this context of maybe this is about something. It's not just chasing a fish. It's not just about power or someone's crazy struggle. It's there's like a, a political angle to it. Like it's become really interesting for me. Um, so, uh, there was one, um, just sort of the introduction in, of Ishmael, like he's talking almost about, like, I can imagine him not just talking about himself personally, but like the American people. Cause he talks about like this restlessness where he's got to find something to do. He's got to, he needs something to do with his life. Otherwise he's going to go knock hats off people. And you could like, you could imagine like, that's kind of the undertone and the fervor the populism of of Jacksonian times are like they need something to do and they kind of need a leader but they're not really sure um and then he eventually takes uh passage with with Ahab and that's why I'm right now like he's on the boat I think Ahab has not quite shown up yet um so, but uh you know the, it's and then the other thing interesting about the book too is like there's a very strong biblical aspect to it because he throws in all these biblical verses and I wouldn't have gotten that in high school but now that I've read uh the Old Testament and the New Testament a couple times like you can kind of get those senses like there's the prophet elijah basically comes to him and it's like watch out bro watch out Ahab's <laughs> not a great guy so you're like it's it's a you guys come along with us get engaged it's gonna be a good book so and but here's the thing that I, and I love and here's part of my like understanding of how to study history you got to study the people you got to study event events and he, here's the kicker you gotta study the entertainment 
Okay. So mm -hmm. like, and, and what was the entertainment back then? It was, it was books. So like I've read the Gilded Age, like, um, let's see, uh, the jungle Don Quixote, obviously that was a little bit before, but you read, you read what was going on of the time from a different perspective than the people that were actually in charge, because this is like the closest you can get to the people's voice realistically is that satire you know from mark twain or uh henry adams or you know um whatever moby dick is i don't know yet because i haven't read it yet but you know it really kind of ties you in and it it helps put all those other pieces together okay all right this is what the rulers were saying this is what the people in charge were saying this is what the people were saying Right. Like this is mm -hmm. this, you, you put all those voices together and now you get a clear understanding of what was going on. So I'm super excited. Like John said, come along with us. I know everybody says it's a boring book, but I bet you they're wrong. No book is boring. You know, when you <laughs> when you have a different context for it, when you think like, oh, this is actually like a political book and you're interested in politics, like just takes a whole different different level to it. So, it, um, you know, I would say at this point, it's definitely not boring. And I'm absolutely loving it, especially with this sort of like new spin on it so uh yeah, right, join us up. join us the water's the water's salty uh the wind is bad <laughs> just because you're in nantucket but uh it's all good i'm gonna start it tomorrow all right it's i'm right. i was i have to finish i have a book on tawny and lincoln i'm only 22 pages into it but i'm gonna like just plow through it tonight because it's only like 200 pages and then tomorrow it's moby dick time and I'm excited to do it. We got to make sure Craig's reading it so we can get it on the group chat. Is is Daniel going to read it? Daniel already read it, right? Yeah, the same thing he read in high school, but I think he's got to reread it with his new with his new spin. So All right. well, we got to like we got to get him on the text and be like, hey, let's do this. All right. Well, um, our next meeting, John, is March 18th, and what are we going to talk about? Communication is representation, right? Representation. Representation is communication. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay we'll get it so representation is well so actually going back to, to math you know with is is an equal verb so communication is representation is the same as representation is communication there that's my political spin i'm not wrong vote for me that's true but it's what people hear not what you say <laughs> so representation is your communication it's your power and your, it's your responsibility uh come out and join us on march 18th we're going to talk about that and the uh, and now i like i was doing like a pitch commercial and i just lost my train of thought that's what happens and moby dick we'll talk about moby dick and moby dick yeah we'll talk about moby dick but it, seriously it's going to be a great class um it's really important uh in february we talked about the republican structure i like to say it's the engine that drives our country in march it's the representation it's the fuel you got to have the right fuel to uh get the engine moving and uh we're going to teach you how that fuel works we're going to teach you how your representation works, how your communication is supposed to work, and how your power is supposed to work, and how it's it's realistically your responsibility. It's a self-governing republic. So um, again, March 18th at Giuseppe's, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, you can RSVP at MadisonianRepublicans.com. Um, remember to like, share the show. You can rate us on uh, Apple, iTunes, or is it podcast or Spotify? And uh, you can subscribe to our Substack at politicsandparenting.com. Um, peace and love.